Welcome to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. What do we tell children who are frightened by all the hype about the end of the world in 2012? What do you do if you walk by your child's room and she's talking with an invisible friend? Hello there and welcome to the 325th edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. I'm Ben, and those troubling questions came from my co-host and partner in the paranormal, my dad. So this is an open line show this evening. We have no guests, so as far as we go with email, it's basically just emails and stuff, so please uh, know that anytime you can give us a good call, you can call in locally or from Canada, and the number is 401-766-1240, and it's also 800-449-1240 from anywhere in the U.S. Again... Locally or Canada, it's 401-766-1240. And from anywhere else in the U.S., it's 800-449-1240. Sometimes listeners tell us that we keep the show moving along in such a way that they don't know when to call. But as Ben said, any time is a good time. We do keep things moving. But we make room for your call uh, whenever you do, do decide to call. And so please don't hesitate to do so. The number again... Uh, locally or from Canada, 401-766-1240 or anywhere in the USA, 800-449-1240. All right, so right now it's time to get to our weekly paranormal contest. And last week's question was, in what country is the Haunted Dream Beach located? Well, the answer is Eitenheim, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Brazil. It's down the coast from Rio. It's right near Sao Paulo. And uh, local, uh, local homeowners and beachgoers there sometimes report seeing ghosts in that area. The Dream Beach, it's called. Uh, it is a well-known tourist destination, believe it or not, but apparently not well enough known to our listeners, uh, none of whom suggested the right answer. All right, so this week's question is, where would you look for the Yeth Hound? And not the Yes Hound. The Yeth. Uh, the, the one who always says yes, but it's Yeth. Yeth. Yeth Hound. That's that's why we're saying it with a lisp. So get that right and win a copy of Left at East Gate about the Renisham Forest UFO incidents by Larry Warren and Peter Robbins, the guests on our CBS edition last evening. You know that already generated a lot of fireworks. Uh, they received a, the, If you're not familiar with the Renisham Forest case, it's very complex. We did 16 hours uh, of specials on it in 2010 uh, on CBS and on uh, the Chief Radio, and boy, oh boy, the sparks flew politically about who saw what when, and all this business. And there's already a challenge from uh, our friend um, uh, Jim Pennison for uh, Larry War, or for rather Peter Robbins to release uh, the tape that he mentioned uh, of the 1988 incident. So we'll see. We'll see where that goes. It's like watching cage fighting. I suppose. I don't know. What are you going to do? Anyway, you can also, as well as calling in, you can also write to us with your answer uh, to paul at behindtheparanormal.com or ben at behindtheparanormal.com. And one more time, the phone numbers locally or from Canada for or anywhere, I guess, 401-766-1240, USA, 800-449-1240. So let's get right to our emails. We have some very interesting emails and some very difficult questions this evening uh, from listeners. This is a question from Elizabeth in Springdale, Arkansas. And uh, Ben, if you would, please. So Elizabeth writes to us, Hi, Paul and Ben. It might take years, but I am listening my way through all 300 or 400 podcasts of your show. I am very impressed by both of you, especially with Paul's seminary background and the compassion you both bring to the paranormal. My question has to do with my two children, a boy and a girl, 10 and 13. The fact is that everywhere we go and every time we turn on a TV, someone is talking about the end of the world. They are very scared. In fact, I'm scared too. Uh, where do I begin to tell them it will be okay? Will it be okay? <laughs> good good question, and I, I wrote some notes here, matter of fact. Uh, I don't know if, if it's accurate to say that every time you turn on the TV or the radio, somebody's talking about that, but there is a lot of banter going on about it. And uh, the, as well as it depends on what you watch, because the main consideration for children is that they be made to feel secure. That's your main job as a parent. And, of course, security and love are, the, are everything. Uh, no matter where you live or what your family situation is, children need to know that there will be a certain amount of positive 
predictability in their lives. There's nothing wrong with routine. As a matter of fact, it's really, really good. With our two children, I don't know if you see how they turned out, but yeah, they're, they're a little different maybe, but they <laughs> always had their routine. They were always with someone who loved them, and they always knew what was going to happen. Uh, they need to know that you will be there when they wake up in the morning, or, or at least that you'll return from work every day, that you will be there, and that they will have a home and decent food and don't have to be afraid, okay? Is there enough fears in childhood as it is? Now, the first thing is to assure them that they are loved and that they will be, uh, you'll be there with them through thick and thin. Hug them. Don't neglect to do that. Hug them and tell them you love them every day. Don't wait. On the other hand, never lie to your children. Now, Elizabeth, uh, your children uh, appear to be old enough to realize that the world can be a dangerous place. They might see horror stories on the news, or if that wasn't bad enough, fictional ones on shows in the evening. Oh, God. Uh, it's on, I can't believe th- Even if they watch, quote, educational media, unquote, like the History Channel, where you might have seen me on a number or a number of other guests you hear on this show... Uh, people are often harping about 2012, the Mayan prophecies and the end of the world. Even if you control what they watch, something that's harder and harder to do in this wired world, still they're going to hear things from their classmates and friends, uh, school shootings, uh, the horrors that seem likely to take place anywhere today, and they know it. They're not stupid. Never assume that your children are stupid or don't know or, or are uninformed. So have honest discussions about that. But keep it in perspective. In other words, bring out the point that bad things have always happened, like earthquakes, tornadoes, and people hurting other people, but that we often didn't hear about it. Now, in this wired world, as I say, you can get on Facebook and see what half the world had for breakfast. You hear everything bad, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that they're any less secure in their own home and in your family than they used to be. In the end, emphasize three things. TV is entertainment, not science. Two, we don't know what is going to happen from one day to the next, but if we stick together, it cannot help but be mostly good things. What happens, if anything, at the end of 2012 is a matter of opinion. We know we're supposedly experts on the paranormal, and we can't tell you. We have no decision or judgment on that. Who knows? Uh, as in other end-of-the-world uh, scenarios, it's probably just a bunch of hype or misinterpretation or whatever. But then again, the world can end any time. <laughs> We've been on the edge nuclear, from a nuclear perspective since 1945 or before. I mean, anything can happen any time. And the best thing to do is just keep your feet on the ground, keep your mind and your children's minds on routine matters and things that are, are good as much as possible. And... Um, that's really all all we can do. If things happen, they happen. You deal with them, and you find that disasters often bring people together. And uh, that's happened even here in our local listening area during blizzards and things, you know, and during the blackouts and the hurricane. Remember, we had an earthquake, a hurricane, and a blizzard all within like three months. Oh yeah, <laughs> last year. Yeah, we had really good luck there. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, people tend hopefully to come together. And uh, number three, in the end, the world is, with God's help, and I assure you there is such a thing as God's help, the world is what we make it. Uh, the children can be excited about what they can do to contribute to that. So I'd say concentrate on that, Elizabeth, and, and uh, also, you know, don't let them turn on just anything. Make sure that uh, there's a balance uh, in what they watch as well as in what they hear and say. Uh, there are, of course, multiverse implications to all this, but I'll leave that for another day because I've thrown enough at you. So I'd, I'd say that that's, uh, that's um, probably the basic place to start. Well, just, just tell them to keep their minds on other things because, you know, they are kids. I mean, kids have other things to worry about. I mean, like when, when their next meal is coming and all that stuff. I mean, rather than... Uh, don't divert it. Like it, it, it's just one of like you don't divert the question. Like, oh, what's going to happen? It's like, oh well, uh, oh look at that, Barney. You can't just di- <laughs> you can't like di- divert it like yeah, that because be yeah. it's it's as a parent you can't really uh, di- divert the um, the question because then they just are like, oh well, my my parents aren't telling me this, and then they feel left out. Yeah. But it's better not. It's better to deliver it to them calmly because when you're calm, they will be calm. Because kids pick up everything. I mean, kids are really observant, despite what people think. Kids are usually on the ball. 
Un- unless they're me and I'm off staring in space like, what? But well, You were the most on-the-ball person I ever knew. Well, it, it, it's just one of those things. I mean, just just stay calm and your kids will be calm. It, that's, okay, that's, yeah. that's my opinion on, mm-hmm. the, on the thing. So, uh, okay. Well, well, we had someone, we, we've said this before in so many words, and someone once, uh, once asked us, what, what if, uh, okay, well, that's all fine, but suppose there is an asteroid or some awful thing that happens. I mean, you know, look, look at the people on the news. You see earthquakes and uh, Haiti, the whole business, and, you know, and we always say to assure children they won't be alone. But suppose they are. I mean, but you, you can't assume that th- th- those are the exceptions. I mean, asteroids, earthquakes, those are the exceptions. For the most part, that sort of thing does not happen to most people. So uh, I think you need to keep it positive. Oh, so that's here's one of those things that bothers me so much. And people are like, oh, what if this? What if this? What if this? Well, what if it doesn't happen? Yeah. It's one of those things where you deal with it when it comes. Well, I remember in, in 20, no, it was, it was uh, 2001. September 11th, or actually September 12th, you were nine years old, uh, thereabouts, and you asked, Dad, are they going to come here to Woonsocket, meaning the, the terrorists and everything else. And, and, you know, we had to deal with that. So that that was a, a legitimate oh, yeah, I do remember childhood that. fear. Yeah. And, yeah, that was uh, pretty scary. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's as close as a lot of children in that day and age came to something like this. Mm. You know, the whole country was uh, brought together. As well as 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 horrified and 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 in mourning for all the the terrible. You know what's bit. weird? My philosophy teacher actually brought this up. My generation has never seen our country at peace. Like ever, like ever since I was born, we've been in desert storm. Yeah. There, the Iraq War, and it's just going on and on and on. So I think it's become just one of those things where it's just an everyday occurrence. Yeah, but it's not real to you unless you're in. I was born exactly. during the Korean War. Korean War was just ending. Eisenhower was president. Gosh, is that possible? <laughs> and, uh, you know, there was a period of peace in the 50s, the much wanted thing, and then Vietnam hit. And then uh, that kind of ended. And then I was in the military myself. And, and uh, just, yeah, so um, e- even even in my generation, there was only pretty much a little bit of peace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was just one of those things. So anyway, it uh, does happen. It has to be dealt with. So here's another one. This is another one about children being afraid. This is from... Janie J. in Charleston, West Virginia. Okay, so Janie writes to us. Hi, Paul and Ben. I have three children that are afraid because they think that this is the end of the world. At least shows like yours uh, take a mostly balanced view of maybe, maybe not, but a lot of these shows on TV don't. This is uh, what the Mayans said, asteroids, earthquakes, aliens, so kiss your rear goodbye. (laughs) (laughs) That's a very... Very good way of putting it. Good old West Virginia colloquialism. (laughs) Yeah. Then we go to church, and our pastor starts in with revelations and the end of the world. So what do I tell my kids? Well, you can't you can't tell your kids while well, Revelations was just an interpretation of how Nero was in ancient Rome because, well, they're kids. <laughs> you can't you can't use arguments like that to describe things like this to your kids. But then you could also just say, well, if it had if. I don't know. I don't know how to put this. It's it's a hard it's a well, hard question the, to answer. Well, the, the, see, now Janie introduces another level to this. It's not only the stuff you see on TV, but they um, go to church, a place that children consider the, the ultimate you know authority or or, or a, sort of clergy in in a church going family are considered major authority figures, and uh, almost on the power of parents. And they go to church and they hear the same. And so naturally, the parents is going to you know, sort of shake their head and. Say, you know, now everywhere you go, even church, you hear this. And uh, a lot of the parents, of course, believe it. Mm. And uh, we've talked about this many times on the show. I mean, I have a background in theology, and I studied the Bible and its original languages. And, all. And you know, the idea that this, this uh, even especially the book of Revelations, which the early church was very wary about putting, very cautious about putting in the Bible when, when they, they finally put the Bible together in its official form in 325 A.D., you know, 300 years after Christ, that, that they, uh, but they, they ended up doing it. But it, it was just, the, the, the danger of misinterpretation was really, really uh, extreme. And an example of that was that nobody really believed it that w- the way you hear it today until the millennialism of the late, uh, 17, uh, late 18th and early 19th centuries in the West. 
and millennialism is is the the literal belief in the you know the the sky turning red and all this stuff happening and all this business. And sure, it's entirely possible. That, but the idea that these people wrote this book for thousands of years in their future is culturally, linguistically, and theologically really, really strange. They almost certainly were talking about the end of Israel as as they knew it in 70 A.D. when the Roman when they, there was a revolution in Israel against the Roman Empire and the Romans didn't take well to being rebelled against. You know, if you kind of kind of minded your business and paid your taxes, they they pretty much left you alone or they're even good to you. But uh, <clears throat> not if you rebelled. And the end of the world really for the the the, the Jewish people came. When Israel was clobbered in 70 AD by the Romans, uh, Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was destroyed, and uh, the diaspora, as it's called, occurred when all the Jewish people were scattered to the four winds of, of, of the earth, as they really are today. You can find, and they developed different traditions, etc. But uh, the fact is, this all pretty much began with 70 AD uh, when this, this, these disasters occurred, and somebody like Nero. I mean, matches exactly the descriptions of the Antichrist and all these numbers. And you have to read it in Greek or you really don't get it. And they're using it. So anyway, the point is that the whole idea of biblical interpretation is a mess. And if you go to a church where millennialism is preached, it's going to scare the kids, probably. Um, they, although, I don't know, there are plenty of people I've met who are strengthened by the whole idea. Mm. Uh, I've always been a little bit wary about that because there, and I, I don't mean to be judgmental, but there seems to be a strain of, you know, my God's better than your God, or I may have been of disaster in life or, or, or done this or done that and been a catastrophe, but at least I'm better than those SOBs who aren't going to be saved and are going to go to hell. I don't like that attitude. And I think that it's, it's, that, that's a problem. So anyway, this whole business about if you go to a church where that's preached, uh, it may scare your kids or it may make them feel superior. I don't know which is worse. That's something you're going to have to deal with on your own, I guess, I'm afraid. But, Janie, thanks for writing. Okay. Here is, um, all right, <clears throat> I've got a rather long one here, but it's very, very frightening, I think, actually, from one of our show reporters. But let's deal with this one first. Uh, this is um, from Pat in Spokane, Washington. Or Spokane, Washington. I've been corrected before. I guess it depends on where you're from. Pecan, pecan, so to speak. Well, exactly. All right, so love the show, Paul and Ben, and I really like the ones you've done about children and their interactions with the paranormal. Now it seems to be happening to me. I was passing my daughter's room the past week, and I heard someone talking. She is six and an only child, and it seemed to be a pleasant conversation. When I asked her about it later, she didn't hesitate. Um, it it uh, was her new friend, Daisy. So, an imaginary friend. I know your theories uh, go way beyond all the traditional ghost stuff, um, but I did grow up around here and know the history of the area. Uh, the fact is that our house is a few years old and is built where there was uh, just woods for centuries, as far as I know. And I can't imagine uh, there would be a connection to any quote unquote daisy here. Uh, what do you think I should do? Uh, my husband thinks it's all baloney. Yeah, very often the uh, the uh, person of the contradictory gender will think it's baloney, especially if they're males. Uh, ben, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, to address the problem, you... Well, let me have yeah, ima- Imaginary friends are, are hard to deal with because, for one... How do you know it's really what it's saying it is? And if if the daughter seemed well, there, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of directions this could go in because it, it for it could be just some visitor from another, not I don't want to say dimension from another world who's like, hey, let's be friends. Or it could be don't want to go way too far to the to the dark and depressing and say it's a parasite because you would probably know by now if it was. And there are. There, there are a lot, of, a lot of questions that need to be answered before we can fully diagnose the situation. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah, it could be anything. Now, let's look at this. This scene appears to have just begun from the tone of, of your letter here. And I think that you need to, uh, first of all, watch the situation. Now, I know we've had, we've had a number of uh, 
this has come up a number of times on the show, especially when we've had Cassandra Eason uh, as a guest. Cassandra is a very well-known British writer who has written almost well over 80 books. It makes me sick. It takes me five years to write a book. <laughs> but she, she's written uh, a book, books on a number of subjects, including dealing with children and the paranormal. Uh, psychic children, all this sort of things. And I, I've had a number of experiences with invisible friends myself, and they have uh, very often been surprising in, in the, the, the difference uh, when it comes to the origin and nature of what they, they are. I always suggest that you err on the side of caution. In other words, don't assume, first of all, nothing in the paranormal is what it appears to be. And this is a mistake a lot of so-called investigators will make. Uh, the, the ghost of your Uncle Charles is very likely not the ghost of your Uncle Charles. It's uh, might, might be something entirely different, perhaps something very negative. You don't know. So I would say uh, here, Pat, to, to watch your little girl and talk to her about this. Don't make her feel that you think she's nuts. Don't make her feel that there's anything uh, bad here. But just when you have an opportunity, uh, talk, talk about this uh, in an honest way and see if uh, maybe she herself doesn't quite know yet who this is, but it's Daisy. And obviously you have talked to her and, and you've already begun this process. So I'd say keep, keep a dialogue going on this. Now I'm thinking of some of the invisible friends I've run into. Uh, ben and I are working in this case in, in Connecticut that we're frequently mentioning, and that really is a landmark case, I believe. Uh, it had to do, there was a, a little boy, uh, three years old, two and three, dealing with an invisible friend called Ashwar. And I remember that one time he said it was in a tree. Matter of fact, we were over there uh, making a pilot for a television show, and, and we hap- I happened to have an infrared camera. I pointed into a tree where he said Ashwar was, and we got this really, matter of fact, this is online, uh, I think, uh, newenglandghosts.com, our, one of our websites, you can see it under Ghosts of Connecticut. And uh, my golly, you can see this thing come down out of a tree, and this was no kid, <laughs> whatever it may have been. Uh, it almost had an alien feel to it. Uh, in this case, as you may remember, if, if you listen to previous shows, involves, started out with ghosts, quote unquote, and ended up with, uh, what appear to be uh, the alien greys that you often hear about and all these things. This this case covers it all. So it could be that or it could be uh, something very benign. I ran into one in Florida at one point, an invisible friend who it turned out, uh, and I was able to uh, communicate with it myself. And it was seemed a little boy from uh, what can only be described as an alternate reality. Um, and this, of course, is the, the multiple world thing is, is the basis of our work. And we feel that it's really opened up and explained a lot in the paranormal that couldn't be explained by, by the, you know, the 19th century seance or approach. And this little boy was talking about how he was, um, uh, in his world, you could very easily deal with neighbors from parallel worlds. It was considered a normal thing to do. And, uh, but he lived in a very different kind of America. The, state of Florida he lived in was part of an empire, a benign empire. Those haven't been too frequent in human history on what was, I guess, we would consider the east coast of the United States. And it was, this. I know a lot of listeners were fascinated by this. That's really about all that he said. Uh, but it was a fascinating experience, and this was not a parasitical entity or anything else. Others have at times turned out to be par- what we refer to as parasitical entities or uh, what in folklore would be known as demons or, or something that does not have our best interests at heart and was masquerading as a child and, and working its way into the family in order to feed on them. So uh, I would say uh, not to be alarmed, uh, Pat, but stay in touch on this with us and... Uh, Keep the dialogue going with with uh, your daughter, even if your husband is n- is not any help in that regard. So I would say uh, that would be about all we can say at this point. Okay, so let's pause for a bit of a break here, and you're listening to Behind the Paranormal on W O O N twelve forty a.m. in the beautiful Blackstone Valley of New England, and also online at onworldwide.com. And 
Be right back. Radio Squares is on the air. Yes, the WON Valley Breeze Radio Squares contest continues all March long on your favorite local radio station and all the editions of the Valley Breeze newspapers. Find each week's Radio Squares game card printed in the living section of the Valley Breeze, available free in locations all over the Blackstone Valley. Keep it by your radio and listen to WON 1240 all day long. Cross off the squares as we call them out on the air. And when you have a straight line of five squares crossed off in any direction, Phone WOON at 762-1240 immediately. Be one of the first ten to do so in each week of the contest, and you'll be qualified to play in the Radio Squares Survival Round, which broadcasts live at noontime on Saturday, March 31st, and the winner there will receive a $500 cash prize. Complete game rules are printed on each game card. Game cards can also be downloaded free from the ValleyBreeze.com website. Each new game starts on Monday morning with Mike and Joe in the morning and continues all day each day until 10 qualify and the card is closed. Play Radio Squares all March long with the Valley Breeze and Owen Radio. Okay, and we wanted to remind you of our uh, generous sponsor here, of course, Amazon Kindle. And this is a this is a marvelous device, makes a terrific gift. Amazon Kindle Fire, particularly one hundred ninety nine dollars, and you can get literally over a million uh, applications, movies, books, magazines, newspapers, all in your hand, without having to travel to the bookstore or without having to go out and buy anything else. And they literally download to this device, uh, which of course is full color and very pleasant to, to use. Wonderful gift. Also, the uh, the cheaper versions, the earlier versions of Kindle, uh, seventy nine dollars. Uh, and you can get these at uh, Staples, many other places, uh, certainly online at Amazon.com. So check it out, Amazon Kindle and Amazon Kindle Fire. You can also, as I always say, get uh, my four uh, most recent books uh, on Amazon Kindle. Uh, of course, for anybody who's interested in history, Rhode Island, A Genial History. And, of course, uh, from the subject of our show, uh, of course, you can get Footsteps in the Attic, Faces at the Window, and Turning Home, God, Ghosts, and Human Destiny. So check it out, AmazonKindle.com. I should say Amazon.com. And check out the product itself, Amazon Kindle. Okay, we are uh, we have a caller here, actually. And, uh, yeah, it's Donna, our reporter, show reporter from Connecticut. How are you doing, Donna? I'm all doing good. Good, nice to hear from you. I was just about to read your... Latest, rather sobering report here, but I'll let you talk about it yourself. Uh, what's going on in central Connecticut that uh, seems to be kind of strange? Well, I um, well, I don't know if you're first talking house-wise or locally-wise. <laughs> okay, well, well, let me give uh, people some background. Uh, Donna's case, and we know she's a show reporter for several years here now with us, but we don't give her last name uh, because we want to protect her identity because her case is one of the most remarkable Ben and I have ever dealt with. We've been working on it since 05, since Donna got in touch with us, and uh, it certainly is a uh, sort of a grand central station of the multiverse, you might say. Many worlds seem to overlap uh, right where her house is, and we've expanded the area of investigation to include sort of a triangle, of which her house is only one point. Uh, there seems to be, we suspect that whether it's the government or whoever, or organization of some, that knows about these multiversal occurrences and is attempting to uh, harness the power thereof to create, to uh, work. Uh, into military systems or, or communication systems or energy production or something. Uh, but this all seems to be wrapped up in this case and in many other cases as well. So uh, we're wondering now about uh, mind control, is it, Donna, would you call it? Um, well, I've been, I, I had reported um, there's, there's very definitely something strange going on in, in the area. Um, Connecticut, as you know, is a small state. Um, the news uh, is generally reported throughout at least three or four, three or four newspapers cover the entire state. So when you get your paper, you will get news from various cities around the state. And I've been noticing very distinctly there's been an increasing, and, and to me it seems like an alarming amount of very strange accidents happening, almost on a daily basis. Um, for three months, I would say at least, there, in the daily papers, you would hear that someone had just driven off the road into a tree. They had no medical problems. They were not, you know, they weren't intoxicated. Um, there were no skid marks. These people just, for some reason, would just drive straight into a tree. In fact, we had one um, just a few months ago, about three miles from our house. Um, this this man just strictly just drove off the road head on into a tree. 
and inevitably they all get killed. It just seems so precise that it's just dead head on. Well, let me just interrupt you for a moment, and people may wonder what this has to do with anything. But there, when we were investigating the area, there there are all sorts of seemingly new communications devices. Uh, there, a particular uh, area that was supposed to be an abandoned farm where military activity had been reported by many residents and UFO activity in the area. Uh, there seemed to be some very odd, uh, whether it be communication or broadcasting devices or microwave devices, and uh, there is a lot of speculation among the conspiracy theorists that these things can affect and are affecting human behavior in a deliberate way. Okay, go ahead, Donna. Um, so, so this was going on for quite a while, and I noticed that um, a few times you say to yourself, Gee, you know, something must be wrong. But then when you, you start reading it every day, multiple locations, and these people, I would say almost 100% of them were, it was on a road where they lived. It was in an area that they were familiar with. Um, then it stopped abruptly. And from then on, like two days later, we started getting reports of people just having head-on collisions, they were just driving across the road, smashing into cars head-on. Um, and in fact, another one happened in our locality, a few miles from our house. The mother, this this young fellow's mother, had it had happened to her two weeks before that. She drove into a tree head-on, but she, she survived it. But she was still in the hospital. And then her son drove into a car head-on in his locality, in a very you know close to home. Just drove into his into a car head-on, and he wasn't on a cell phone. He wasn't intoxicated, and it was on a straightaway where um, there were no car, other car, cars involved. Nobody witnessed it, and almost immediately that stopped. And now we have a rash of people driving the wrong way on highways. And I realize people are distracted, but these are people who live in the area. They know the highways. We we don't have a lot of major highways around here. There are two that are in the you know local local area, and one of them happened to be a friend of my sister's who. Um, was following a friend of hers, and the friend pulled onto a highway, an interstate, going the wrong way, and she tried to follow her and watch the girl get killed head on, oh. um, on the wrong way, going the wrong way, and she could. They were not drunk again. They were not on cell phones. They were going home after visiting someone else. And I mean, to me, it's just it just seems so strange that it's like a group of one thing. It just stops. And then within a few days, this whole other rash of things, and then it stops. And then again, all another situation. And, it, and it's like people just, I followed a, a truck home yesterday and on, on the road that comes to our house, and he was driving along, everything was fine, and all of a sudden, on the main straightaway, he pulled across the yellow line, there was nothing coming, and he drove in the wrong lane, going just, you know, and I, I, I was just horrified. There was not, nothing coming, and there was no corners right there. But for no apparent reason, he wasn't swerving. He wasn't. He just drove into the wrong lane and started driving, driving there. Wow! And I and I just I you know I said I gotta gotta let Paul know about this. Yeah. But you know, thank heaven, some innocent person hadn't been coming the other way. And I, I just have no idea. You know, to me, it's very odd. And with all this new, I mean, our city has new antennas up. They have. They're putting multiple of everything up. And for the size of our city, it's just such overkill. Yeah, I mean, it's really not very big. And you also mentioned uh, the the uh, people coming to your house and putting in a new kind of meter with an antenna on it. Well, yeah, I had I had read been reading up on the the new smart meters that they're putting in. Um, they they had few test test areas, but they had been trying to force them into California. And these meters um, give off radiation. They pulse every fourteen seconds. They're considered what they call a smart meter. <coughs> They transfer data back and forth, and people have been having a lot of physical problems, and they cannot get them. I think it's um, PE&G maybe is the electric company and the water company out in California is the name of the company that's been putting the them Pacific out. Pacific Gas and Electric, yeah. Yeah, people are trying to opt out of this because they've. I've read a page, a page after page actually, of people going crazy because they got these things in their house. They're, they're not only water but gas and electricity. And if you're in a condensed area... You're not just getting them from your home, like an apartment complex. You're getting them from everywhere. It's ca- causing like a uh, a major problem. They have um, sleeplessness, massive headaches, ear ringing, deafness, um, anxiety. All co- there, there's just a whole list of symptoms, and they're trying to get to be able to opt out of having them in their homes. 
There are a few people who have actually had to call an ambulance. They were disoriented. They couldn't stand up. And it never happened like in the 30 years that they had lived in their home. And then all of a sudden they put these things in and people are having all these, these problems. And it seems to be with the dizziness, the sleeplessness, the, the anxiety, it's like, like causing their whole system disruption. Well, not yeah. like, not like stomach aches and stuff like that, that, you know, it's not the flu. People have actually had to move out of their home, leave their home because they cannot stay in their house. They leave their home within 30 minutes, they're fine. They go back to their home and they've got the same thing going on. Um, the one that they came and they put into our house unannounced, um, they just drove up to our door and said that they needed to put a new water meter in. And I asked my husband, I said, please go downstairs, make sure it's not a smart meter. He got confused. The man kind of double-talked him. Oh, no, no, we don't even know what those are. So <laughs> I went down, and the first thing I noticed that there was an antenna on it. And I said, this is not a normal water meter. So I went onto the website that makes them, and they certainly advertised them. These are our smart meters. And I was totally shocked because we had no information. There was no data safety Product different product information. There was nothing. They just came and put this thing in and left. So um, did, did you called, let me let me ask? Did you or your husband ask for identification from these people? Were they worrying? Oh, it was the water. It was the local water company. They had they had a sign on the truck. Oh well, we had people come to our house trying to do the same thing, and I, we we checked them out. And they were not from the electric company. They didn't know who they were. They had badges. They had signs on the trucks, and the electric company didn't didn't. Or I should say the gas company too did not. Say, said that they, they were, didn't belong to them. Right. Well, we didn't think about, you know, he just went Yeah, I mean, who would? Right. You don't think about it. Especially no. you know where we live, right? You know where we live. It's like, okay, it, it's like Hooterville. Nobody <laughs> no, nobody bothers, you know. But, yeah, it's rural but, area. Yeah. Yeah. But they they um, they um they put it in, and I, I, after I went on, I went on to their website, and I looked it up, and then I went on to um, the Internet, and I started reading about the product itself, and I saw where they had a radiation detector next to it, and it was pulsing every 14 seconds, and it was putting out readable radiation oh, every go. 14 seconds. And it said that it could actually turn your basement or wherever the, wherever the meter is into a radioactive zone. So I called the water company, and I, I asked to speak with a supervisor, and he, of course, he assured me over and over, oh, no, these are not the same things, and, and you know, no, we're, we're, we're not going to grandfather anybody in. These all are going to go in when you need your water meter changed. and you know, So they, you have they, no choice. Right, you have no choice. So I called City Hall, and I left a message for them, and I told them I wanted it removed. I was not going to fight with the water company. I knew what it was, and I did not want it in my home. And this was last week. I've never heard back from them. So now I have to decide what step I'm going to take next. Apparently, our attorney general in the state has put a ban on them until they can be further um, and further investigated because they know of all the complaints people are having. Yeah. But our our water company is a private water company, so they may not go underneath. You know what I mean? They may not be regulated through a certain agency like other ones might uh, be. I rather doubt that everything's regulated. Right. But no, I see what you. I see your point. Of course, the question is, you know, people might say, well, this could be just a coincidence. It could be anything. Everything's getting more technological. Uh, I myself like the idea of not having to answer the door and let let the meter reader in as if it's 1960. But the right. thing, yeah, the thing like, is, it's just the, the, it's just too big of a coincidence where it's like everybody gets these things in their homes and they all start having health problems. And yeah. it's not just in this area. It's in other areas around the United States where these things have been installed. The, the, there are other factors besides the people like, oh, well, uh, maybe you're just uh, crazy or something. Or it's just well, Ben's right. There are too many coincidences. And especially in this case, Ben, we've been investigating this case for years. And we do. most people don't do that. We spend years on cases we find connection after connection after connection that really are undeniable. Well, you know, too, Paul, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a coincidence that every time I try to email you information, my computer crashes. I yeah. can email everybody in the world, and I can, I can do anything, but when I go to email you photographs, when I go to email you information. Now, you know recently that I, I had been sending journals to someone, yeah. and I could not actually get them out. They, I could not get them out. Really? It w wouldn't go, wouldn't go. Well, you that know, was overseas. I, so, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, wouldn't go. And uh, um, a regular, you know, hello, greetings, how are you, goes fine. But the minute I try to enter information into the computer of any, any sub, you know, substance, it, it won't go. It just will not, cannot go. I spent like three days trying to get something out, and it just sat there. It wouldn't do anything. I went in, I checked, emailed, answered everybody else. And it's not overseas. I've, I've had other people that 
that I have emailed overseas. Yeah. And I've, you know, I've done business overseas, you know, like through eBay and stuff. I never had a problem. But it's when I, whenever, when I try to email a picture, when I, it, it almost seems like you're being somehow blocked. Yeah. You know, I mean, tell us about it. I mean, I mean, you, you can sit there and say, well, you know, it happens once, it's a coincidence. You know, it's, it's right. one of those things. It happens twice, three times, it's a coincidence. But four, five, six, constantly, yep. it's, it's got to, you know, statistically, it's got to be more than that. Yeah. Well, I've even had to take photographs. And I don't like to think about it. I've even had to take photographs off my computer when I, off the screen, from, you know, take a, stand in front of the screen and take a picture because the specific photographs, it will not download. And it all has okay. to do, right now, with paranormal. All right, with your case and the UFOs and the stuff. Right, yeah, right. Okay, yeah. Well, we, we just can't escape the conclusion that it's in your area, it's all connected. And, I mean, certainly that um, abandoned farm, if that's what it was, and and we're the ones who've been talking about it on this show. Nobody else seems to be, uh, no other, I don't know, no other investigators or, or, or shows seem to have picked it up. Oh, uh, I think it's definitely affecting people. Well, plus the cell phones, which they say, you know, after repeated use, um, there's a lot. There's a lot of. There's too much energy. Um, people are absorbing it, and it's got to be doing something to yeah, it. Yeah, well, it it's called electro pollution. Is is one of the things. But I, I'm curious to see. Well, I'm sure Ben will agree. What it's going to do to your, the, the, to the events in your house. Yeah, right. We haven't even mentioned on this show the the uh, the, the the circus from a paranormal perspective <laughs> where you live. Well, you know. A, a, Paul, I, had, I was listening to the previous, uh, the person who wrote in about the child with the, um, and you were talking about Ashwar. Yeah. And I had spoken that's not, with this, my, That's Donna's case, everybody, yeah. Right. I had spoken with my grandson the other night. I tucked him in, and I was sitting on his bed, and I was talking to him, and I said to him, gee, you know, I, I have not heard about Ashwar in quite a while. And he said, oh, she's gone. And I said, well, what do you mean, where did she go? He said, she, she told me she didn't need me anymore. And he said, she just went back. Interesting. So, you know, whatever whatever reason it was here, she was here, whatever, um, he just stated that she told him she didn't need him anymore, and um, she went back. So I don't know where she went back to. Well, not not to speak for my son here, but, I mean, when we were there investigating this, uh, it seemed w- the conclusions we were reaching and that he was reaching and that I agreed with were that there was research going on about these, for lack of a better term, portals in your area. Right. Yep. And yep. Uh, attempting to harness, uh, I don't know, Ben, maybe you can des- describe it better than I can. No, no, you, you were hitting the nail on the head. Just like pro- Attempting to harness the energy? Yeah, like or- Project Stargate kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. Well, and, well uh, see, that's what I'm concerned. That's one of my concerns is having this thing in the basement um, where a lot of the activity takes place. In fact, most of it recently. Um, a- any kind of an electrical uh, pulsating thing that's going to be put in there, is it going to attract more? Is it going to... Make it easier for something else to come through. Well, it can affect the EM fields that that, that allow the process to occur when these things come through. Because we've been hearing, um, we heard someone screaming the other night. Yeah, you were mentioning that. Now, usually you don't have anything that, that well, it's not only really you don't know if it's negative, but I mean, it could be just a pass through, or, but, but you've said it's happened several times. Yeah, well, my daughter came in last night. She said, What is going on in there? And I, I we were watching, we were just sitting there quietly watching TV. I said, Nothing. Why? She goes, it sounded like somebody was taking the house down in there. She's like, you're banging and slamming. We didn't hear a thing. We but, didn't but hear a thing. But you hear it at different times. Yeah. You don't yeah. all hear it together. That, that, that I find very interesting. Right. She'll, she'll hear it. I'll, I'll hear it. You know, it's the same noise, but it will be in the general vicinity, but there's just a wall between us. Well, but, okay, go ahead. But she'll hear it, and then, you know, like, I'll hear it. It's, like, delayed or something, and I'll go running in there. What You know, what are you doing in here, you know? So it's, it's just, it's very strange, but... Well, we're planning to, uh, hopefully in May at some time, when we hear back from the venue, at least set up some sort of uh, town hall meeting in your city and uh, get some of your neighbors and people to come in because we always find, as we always say on the show, that these things are never limited to one house, and this is a showcase of that. Uh, it seems to involve the entire area. And as you say, your neighbors uh, uh, have reported strange things. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of the man who uh, won't stay in the house alone when his wife isn't there. I know. <laughs> yeah. And you never know what to look at him. His wife told me on the yeah, TV right. about that one. <laughs> That's it. Mind you, Jesse Ventura, who would have a lot of pungent things to say about this and who we hope to have on the show uh, in the near future to talk about things like this. But um, anyway, uh, this, well, uh, all I can say is thank you, Don. Hang in there, and we're going to be coming over with, uh, in, in force as soon as we can and have, have a, a meeting, a presentation in your area. Uh, oh, I'm sure, I'm sure you'll have a very lively discussion because I know that there's a lot of people who – 
just for one reason or another, either they just don't happen to connect with someone who has the same experience. But I know that there's a lot of stories out there, and I'm sure you'll hear a lot of it. Well, it's not just that, too. Yeah, I'm thinking, too, of, of other people we're in contact with in other areas of central Connecticut, which, as you say, is not very large. Right. Because coming from Rhode Island, everything's big. Right. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's a matter of, of a lot of strange UFO sightings yes. that have been going yep. on, uh, particularly of triangular craft. And uh, there, there are those who say, well, they're just government crap. Maybe they are. I don't know. Well, but, I, I talked to you about that, that craft that I saw. Yes, exactly. And Would it, you it was, uh, say that for, for the for the folks? Because that's uh, well, it was yeah, it was in broad daylight um, downtown in the, the the city where I live, a small city, thirty five thousand people. And I was standing in front of my son's house, and the sun was shining, and I was just outside getting a breath of air, and I happened to look to my right over the river, and here comes this low flying, very wasn't going fast uh, craft, and it was so narrow that a person could not be sitting in that. It was it, not deep, is what I'm saying. It was it was kind of triangle in shape, and it had a bar that went underneath the point in the front, and it had a bar sticking out the back. Just looked like it's just a, a rebar or something sticking out there, and it was not as loud as a light plane, but it was a little bit louder than what you might think of like as a hobbyist hobbyist plane. But it was too big yeah. to be something that could have been launched from a park or something. And, it, and I just stood there looking at it for lack of anything else. It was a dull silver, not a uh, shiny silver. Um, and it just it just came into view and just followed the river up and went behind the houses. And I, you know, as usual, you just stand there with your mouth hanging open. And <laughs> you, what do you do? I mean, I didn't have. Yeah. <laughs> if I had had a camera, it would have been wonderful. Well, but, I mean, you, you, do you, you should at least maybe get an iPhone. Maybe we'll get you an iPhone for Christmas or there something. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Yep. But, I mean, there's a fellow named Rutan who designs all kinds of really bizarre aircraft. But, I mean, the, the more you described it, it just didn't sound like that. It just sounded completely uh, aerodynamically odd. Well, it was odd in the fact that nobody could have been in it. Nobody could have fit in this thing. Sitting, laying, otherwise, it was very shallow. Yeah. But it was a good size. I, you know, I, I think I described it to you. I can't remember exactly, but it was, it was a good size thing. You know, maybe, maybe twenty something feet long, and you know, it was, it was shaped like a triangle. And and I just stood there, and, and you know, you're seeing this. Well, you know, me in our house, it's the same thing. What are you going to do? You know, something appears in front of you. What are you going to do? You just stand and look at it. <laughs> well, there is an opinion that, uh, of course, there's, there's been some uh, talk about drones, the military drones uh, right, being right. placed on patrol over the country. Right. Uh, something I find a little bit disconcerting. Well, they want 30,000 of them, I guess, in um, in a few years. Well, to do what? Yeah, why? <laughs> I, well, I've heard the opinion that it's when they cancel the November presidential election. <laughs> God forbid. Uh, but anyway, you know, the crowd control. But who knows what we're up against here? I mean, it seems like we're just, I don't know, but you. But as a citizen, and this is not really paranormal, maybe it is. I don't know. I think there are paranormal aspects to this. Uh, I feel out of control. I feel out of control, I've, too. I've tried to be a responsible citizen all my life. I've been a veteran. Uh, ben and I and our whole family, we go vote. Yep. Together, we take it as very seriously as our duty, and um, you know, the, the, it, it's I don't know. Some, I've been trying to step up on. to the plate. I've been trying to step up to the plate for years, and I'm, of course, you know, I don't mind saying I'm I'm over sixty. I don't mind stepping up to the plate. I love a good fight. If it's something I believe in, I'll fight and I'll fight and I'll fight. Yeah, me too. But I'm finding increasingly over the years, and and it's getting worse now, where you don't even know where to start. Yeah, it's, there's layers of bureaucracy. There's layers. And you can never get to the one above the one that you're talking to. Um, no matter, by hook or by crook, no matter how you try, I've emailed the governor over issues. And you're, you're getting um, John Boy Jr. in the basement who works, you know, works at a coffee table because they're not going to let you get up you know, to where you need to be to actually make a difference. And I found <clears throat> more and more they're passing issues, they're yep. passing laws, um, and they're just, they're, it's like rogue. They're just going rogue. It's, it, it, nobody has a say, and, and it's scary because you, a lot of the laws, you don't even know what they are anymore. Well, that's the thing, and, and Rhode Island is an interesting place because, uh, again, I don't want to get off too much off the topic here, but, but it, it's a place where it's so small, mm-hmm. and the whole state is 47 miles long, or what, something 38 miles wide, 47 yeah. miles. Everybody knows everybody else. It's more like more like a small town. You can't hide from somebody by shopping in a different supermarket. Right, right. And uh, even here, there's a sense of unreality. I mean, and, and you know, and we can really influence our government, at least I, I naively, maybe I'm naive, but I think we can because we just, hey, you raise enough cane, they're going to hear you. 
Right. Because right. you run into the governor at the supermarket, for heaven's sake. Right. You know? And right. Uh, it's, but I don't know, but still there's something strange. And, and I, if, when it gets into these ideas, secret bases and all this stuff, I've never been a conspiracy theorist. But the information we're privy to on this show from certain, it's just, it really makes you wonder. Right. Uh, something's, com- something's coming. Um, it, it's just really strange. And it, I don't know if we're on the right, it might not even be the government. Right. The government may be a victim of this too. Uh, well, you know, Paul, I see more and more, more and more, um, UFO information released. Um, I think with the advent of, of cameras, cell phones, recorders, yeah. I think it's getting more and more difficult to just sweep under the rug. That's true. Ben, you got any um, thoughts on this? We're monopolizing the conversation here. It's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> because that's usually what happens. But no, it's going to be great when we have Jesse Ventura on the show because this is going to be basically the whole conversation. Oh, my gosh. Well, because he, he'll, he's a conspiracy theorist to say the least, but uh, you know what? Well, you know what? What used to be a conspiracy, they're finding out is true. Yeah. In a lot of cases, um, a few years back, oh, they're going to do this and that, and they do it. And, you know, it's like, but up until they do it, everybody's a conspiracy theorist. That's it. Well, think things that were the subject, you know, they'd lock you up to if you talked about them 10, 15 years ago. Now it's a normal conversation. Right, right. That's it. Well, Donna, thanks for calling in. It was, you always add spice to the show, and uh, we're going to continue certainly with your case and see if we can't set up that uh, neighborhood meeting. or. or Sounds meeting good, soon. and I'll keep you updated on anything further. Please do. Fits, okay. Fits into the puzzle. All right, thanks okay, a lot, Donna. Okay, Paul. Bye, Ben. Okay. Bye. All right. Uh, we time maybe for one more email here. This is um, from Margaret in Missouri. Margaret of Missouri. Oh, alliteration. Yes. All right, so Margaret writes, uh, For the past year, I have had bad dreams and later apparitions, uh, things moving around the house, smells and strange voices. I'm a widowed grandmother and live alone. I called my minister and he came out to see me. He looked around the house and said a prayer with me, but assured me that it was all in my head. I've heard you talk about how the clergy usually how cler- the clergy usually don't know how uh, to deal with any of this, and it was hard to believe until it happened to me. Uh, what do I do now? That's well, a real tough question. Go ahead, Ben. Well, it's funny that you mention that because that same thing actually happened to me, and you know what? That was actually a really really terrible time, because not only was it very disconcerting that you have something from a nightmare come out in real life but the thing was that it was parasitic and the only way to really deal with that is through positive energy which is what we always talk about on this show and how to deal with things like that usually if you stay in your house for long periods of time stuff builds up and then things get progressively how to put it? I don't. I don't know how to put it. Well, I think things you, know, you said it, it gets built up. Yes, uh, a lot of people up. are the victims of parasites who are uh, invalids or think they're invalids, and they just they don't get out and, and, and spread their energy around. Yeah, so they sit there and feed the parasite. Basically, yes. So what we would like to suggest to you is to uh, go out or get a hobby or something, something to occupy your time. Um, if you can't go anywhere find someone to take you somewhere i mean even if you go to like church every so often that's that's a good way to get out and things like that well you mentioned your uh, widowed grandmother here uh, margaret uh you know spend more time with your grandchildren if you can uh, hopefully they don't live too far away you didn't specify that but i know you, you certainly rely on your minister for many things and uh, you believe in him or her and and you want to certainly do what you're told but they just they don't have the knowledge half the time and uh, i would say uh, keep it positive. Do as Ben said. Bring in the positive energy there. Keep your mind on other things and try to get out of the house more. And then keep us posted as well. Yes, because keeping us posted is always good. Yeah, because then we can, you know, get some kind of a maybe better handle. But of course, we have we have hundreds of people keeping us posted, so th- that can be a little bit. Uh, you know, we we have a lot to do, but we we try to pay attention as much as we can to anybody who uh, needs uh, needs assistance. Um, okay, now, ooh, there's one I wanted to get to, but I'm just not going to be able to get to it. Um, no, we don't have enough time for that. Okay, came in on Facebook. Well, we we'll just well, that's why we're going to do another show next week like this and uh, to keep up with these emails. Okay, well, I wanted to thank everybody for listening today. Uh, check out our website at behindtheparanormal.com. You can get all sorts of information about our guests, uh, upcoming future, and also coming up on 400 
free podcasts you can get. If you have a lot of time on your hands, you can catch up on all our shows. And funny, Ben, I, I always like to be, oh, I, I, I like to go into work and listen to your podcast. What do they do for a living? <laughs> yeah. They're very uh, indulgent boss, I guess. Well, they, they could put it on a CD, drive to work that way. and. Uh... Well, we're thinking about all kinds of things like that. We just There's only really two of us. We, we have a little bit of secretarial help, but not much, and it's, it's getting to the point where, we're, where the show is expanding to the point where we're going to need some... Uh, assistance oh, and maybe yes. put out a few CDs, things of this kind. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, many thanks to our producer, uh, the great Ben himself, who's been uh, working cool. the board the past few weeks for the station here. And it uh, looks like I'm going to be permanent with that. Looks so. good. You're doing a fine job. Well, thank uh, you. And we'll see you next Monday, March 12th, right here on WOON, 1240 AM and ONWorldwide.com. When Ben and I uh, will do another of these open line shows to just try and catch up on these emails, uh, we we had scheduled a UFO expert and author, Dr. Lynn Kitai, expert on the Phoenix Lights phenomenon, uh, for an update. But we're going to bump her to the following week. So next week will be an open line show, and Dr. Lynn will be with us the week after that. All right. So on our regular CBS edition on Sunday, March 11th, in Boston, Pittsburgh, Detroit, and Seattle, we'll host the second of two roundtable discussions that go deeper into the events at the 1980 Reynoldsham Forest UFO case. And our guests will be eyewitnesses, retired UFO Air Force personnel, John Burroughs, and well, U.S. Air Force personnel. U.S. Wait, that's what I said, right? You said UFO Air Force. Personnel. U.S. Sorry. Hey, who knows? Sorry. It's the UFO case. You yeah. There's too many U's. Just whatever. <laughs> okay. John Burroughs, Jim Peniston. Use guys. Okay. Well, we'll leave you this evening with a quote from the American author, Wynne Borden. Quote, if you wait to do everything until you're sure it's right, you'll probably never do much of anything. Unquote. Thanks for joining us on our great cosmic journey, and we'll see you next time. Return to this radio frequency 167 hours from now for another edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno.